the the threat of an attack from Germany upon the United States and upon the East Coast uh, was subsiding. All right, there's a couple slides coming up here. These are just articles that I found. They'll be interesting for you to read when you when you look at the actual report that I generated. Next slide. Um, plane spotted swing into action. Next slide. Uh, this one just said it'd be nice for you every, for the people in York to, to don't donate coffee and coffee and evaporated milk for some of these people that are giving their time down there. And uh, which is probably true. Next slide. I'm going to you can read about this, but I'm going to skip over this piece for the sake of time. So let's let's talk about this one. Oh, well, that looks like it might be out. No, that's okay. We'll leave it there. I want to talk about dim outs, blackouts, and wardens. Can, what's, what's, yeah, leave it right on there. I think we're all set. Um, one of the concerns was lighting. And if there were German subs, U boats out in the ocean, if they had a background of light, they could silhouette a ship and spot a ship and potentially attack it. So the goal is, is to have the houses and to have the property on the land be, be the lights be extinguished so that from the ocean side, you couldn't, couldn't really tell um, what was there. Nothing could be silhouetted. Dim outs was an excess was something that was mandatory. I'm just talking about voluntary stuff. This was mandatory. People had to dim their lights. Uh, and they had rules and regulations around it. Everybody in York had to do it. They were more particular right along the coast. But at 30 minutes after sunset, people had to draw curtains. They had usually people had black shades in their house and they dropped them down. But you had to block the light that was inside your house from shining out. And it was, again, it was a mandatory. Store owners, no big display windows, no lights there. They had to be extinguished. So it was not a real pleasant task to go shopping when it was very, very dim lighting. And vehicles also, uh, the headlights were an issue. Some people drove with just the parking lights, which was fine, but they did they did produce uh, uh, like a headlight cover, but most people didn't use those. I asked my dad when he was alive about what he did, and he said he put black electrical tape over the top half, and most people did this, over the top half of the lights on the vehicles, and that forced the light down into it, and, and it was acceptable from it not shining out into the ocean. So my dad used black electrical tape. And as I say, most, most other people, that's how they dim their lights. Blackout were blackout drills. One of the things that they learned from England was, you know, if the Germans are gonna bomb, they really would like to look down and to see where they are, if it was an industrial area or a big city. But if all the lights are out, the theory is, is that the Germans wouldn't know what's down below. They wouldn't know what they're bombing. They don't, can't identify their targets. So there were blackout drills that were held for a couple of years, 42 into 43, where all lights had to be extinguished. And the army at some times would actually um, do inspections. But most of the inspections were done by the volunteers. Uh, but these blackout uh, drills, as I say, they were very, they were real important. Towns would usually do them in groups, all like here's York and Wells had a, had a drill. Uh, they, this particular one kind of struck my fancy. This was a blackout drill that was held in York Beach. And I, it, First of all, I realized that's right. York Beach had tourists at that point in time. This was this drill was held in 
July of 1942. Apparently, the patrolman flashlight, he it was shining too much. And so he borrowed some lipstick from a young lady from Boylston, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and he covered the lens of his flashlight. And that that was great. Covered it up and he was able to uh, uh, continue with his patrols. The. Let me just read some of this. The interesting thing for me, though, is that I started to research a little bit. It's in my paper about uh, the state of Maine, and they passed some regulations that talked about blackouts in for hotels, rooming houses, apartments, where it became mandatory that people that own these facilities had to have a blackout plan. And it had to be a written plan of what you're going to do and who's involved and how how's the inspection of it going to happen. So the state of Maine got involved with the tourist side of hotels and rooming houses. Very, very important to um, the old, the the review of this these drills. Next slide. Um, the Maine State Police, there was a fellow here in York named Henry Weaver, who was chief of the Maine State Police. He actually lived in York Beach, but he started laying the law down on, on dim outs. And I put two different um, newspaper articles in here about how the state police handled drills and uh, dim out regulations. Go to the next slide. I think it's it's very similar, but... The motorists were warned. There were signs on Route 1 uh, talking about how the regulations were being watched over and what you had to do. There was no main turnpike back then. Um, and, and in this newspaper articles, it talks about if there were offenders, then they were going to be hailed into court and uh, and summonsed. So... The state police were involved in this too. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about air raid wardens. Air raid wardens were in all towns. They were the people that kind of sat between a neighborhood and the people in houses in the neighborhood and the civil defense organization. Uh, these wardens were in charge of usually two, three, four streets in the neighborhood. And th these streets, were it was called a sector. In York, there were 23 sectors that were uh, established. And they all had an air raid uh, warden assigned to their sector. The air raid wardens could answer any questions, they disseminated information, but they also walked the streets uh, 30 minutes after the lights had to be dimmed and they were able to, if there were lights on, they would notify people, you, you know, you had to have your lights off. The, uh, they wore helmets and they had training in first aid. They wore an arm patch, this is the arm patch, that the air raid wardens wore. Let's go to the next slide. I think this is, yeah, I'm, this is good. Um, the wardens didn't have enforcement capabilities. They could warn people, they answered questions, they understood the people in their neighborhoods. But if people, got stubborn and didn't want to abide by the dim out and even the blackout types of procedures, yet the wardens would summons the police. Well, there weren't enough police in York. So there were 13 individuals that were deputized. Deputy sheriffs were appointed for wartime duty. I've got the list of the 13 men that were here in York. 
that were the ones that rep could go out into these um, into in the town, and they had the authority to make arrests if people weren't abiding by the um, by the dim out and blackout regulations. Again, I like this type of an article because it has the name of the New York citizens, all volunteers again, that would help with the enforcement of dim out and blackout procedures. Let's go to the next slide. One thing I looked for when I was looking at, at the Portsmouth Herald and I, again, I, I smiled a couple of times. This is, I smiled when I found this article. Sector sites, wardens listed in full for York. And I have them in here. Um, you can go to the next slide. And uh, this is sector number one through sector 10. Go to the next slide. And uh, we'll just take a look at that. This is sector 11 to section sector 23. It has the names of all the streets. It has the areas that were, how the town was divided by sectors. And it really important, it has the name of the warden that was assigned to these sectors. Usually somebody that lived right in, in on the street. So excellent type of information as far as, well, who were the volunteers that were air raid wardens in the town of York? Well. Here's a comprehensive list of, of them all. Um, great, great newspaper article that I found on that one. Let's go to the next slide. This is just a, this is a picture that was in the newspaper, not the newspaper, the old York Historical Society of from 1943 of the York Fire Department continuing uh, training. By 1943, uh, the training for air raids had really tapered off, but it looks like the York Fire Department continued with their training and people were still interested. This is a picture taken in a similar location from the one that we saw from 1941 uh, because it says First National Store there. And again, that's where, where the Cumberland Farms is, but this is downtown York Village and the firemen continuing to train. Let's go to the next one. Dim out, suspend dim out. Dim out regulations started to get toned down in the spring of 1943. They were relaxed. Uh, by relaxed, uh, it was like instead of 30 minutes after sunset, you had to have the lights in your house ex dimmed was one hour after. So they started to relax. By the fall of 1943, October of 1943, they did away with demo requirements. People were pretty happy. By the way, February of 44, I was looking up a timeline. I was trying to make a little timeline. The Portsmouth Council of Defense was greatly reduced in February of 44. So the threat of a German air attack or the threat of, of uh, a naval attack was pretty much subsided by 1944, the beginning of 1944. People were pretty happy about that. And it also kind of, I mean, the war was still going on and there was still work to do and we'll talk about that, but at least from an air attack and a naval attack, it was felt that it was, the, the threat had been subsided. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I, I just put this in here. This is the stores in Portsmouth that, that they said, hey, you can now do your shopping. It's bright again. And uh, there was a quote in there. It says, Saturday night shopping is once again a pleasant task. So for a couple of years, you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't see where I guess where you shopped. I like this because down at the bottom, were all the stores in downtown Portsmouth. I mean, there weren't mall, malls at the time, um, but most people that wanted to do shopping, I mean, there was a lot of stores in downtown Portsmouth. And this is a good comprehensive list of what the stores were in, in uh, 19, at the end of 1943 or November. This article came out in November 5th, 1943. 
let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about the military's um, involvement in the town of York. This is not, I'm going to be talking about, what I'm going to be talking about doesn't involve civilian volunteers, but I, it's important to know about facilities that were here in York that had, um, that were connected to the military, just for your own curiosity, I guess. There were six structures in town that had some connection to the military. The two lighthouses, Boone Island and Nubble Light. Both Boone Island and Nubble Light had watchtowers. They were wooden watchtowers. The one out at Boone Island had a crew of 10 people. They were armed with rifles. They were Coast Guard individuals. These were enlisted men in the Coast Guard. And um, th they would rotate. The ones out of Boone Island could you get two days of shore leave every couple of weeks. It had to be boring on Boone Island. They were looking for U-boats or landing parties or anything suspicious. It just had to be terribly boring to be sitting out at Boone Island looking for German German crafts and, and U-boats because they didn't find any, by the way. Uh, this is a picture of Nubble Light of, from the war years. You can see the watchtower that was built, wooden watchtower between the light tower here and the triangular bell tower. Uh, the next slide, let's go to the next slide. You, it shows the back view of the Nubble and that little watchtower that was built on the rocks there that was again staffed by Coast Guard individuals during the war. I know, you know, you can almost date some of these pitches because this watchtower was only during the war. You can see Mount Agamenicus, by the way, up in the background there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, there was a facility on top of Mount Agamenicus. It was run by the Army, the U.S. Army Signal Corps. It was essentially a radar facility. It had 25 soldiers. First year, 42, they were put up in tents. And, but then they built, from 43 on, they built um, facilities where, the, where these people stayed. They built a tower, a steel frame tower. You can see it in this picture for the radar side. I think the uh, footings for that tower about the only thing that's left up on top of Mount Agamenicus that were from this radar facility that was up there. This was not connected to uh, the Portsmouth Harbor defense side. It was a bit independent, but uh, it shows a little bit about it. There was a big fire, I understand. I was reading it in the winter of 1945. Most of this buildings burnt down because the fire trucks couldn't get up to the top of Mount Agamenicus put the fire out but by 1980 or so all of the all of these facilities all of these buildings there's nothing left up there with them next slide i talked about the the guns that were being excuse me i was talking about the the big guns that were being put in at Fort Dearborn and Fort Foster in, uh, in at the mouth of the Piscataqua River. Those guns needed to have, um, needed to have locations of surface ships identified. And uh, so the, I had mentioned that there were a number of towers and barracks that were built along the coast and there were three in the town of York that were built. One was at Bald Head Cliff, uh, right near the, the old Cliff House facility. They shut the Cliff House down during World War II, by the way. And uh, they had a tower. All the towers were built out of reinforced concrete so that if they did get attacked, at least the tower would be standing. And they had a barracks where the Army Coast, this, these were staffed by the Army Coast Artillery, and I and this picture, my actually my mother took this picture from 1951, and you can see at the top of the hill. This is taken from Sawyer Park out at the Nubble, but at the very top of the hill, 
there's a building, a big building. And that was the Army Coast Artillery Lookout Tower. Contrary to what I've heard over and over for years, these were not lookout towers for submarines. They weren't. I've always always heard, oh, they're Coast Guard towers that were looking for submarines. They weren't. They were run by the Army, and they were looking for surface ships. And these towers would use a method called triangulation to uh, precisely identify where a surface ship was out in the ocean. They would call in the information to, um, to Fort Dearborn, and that information would be in turn, would be passed over to the, to the soldiers that were running the guns, and they could fire up to 25 miles out into the ocean and hit a target, a precise hit on a target. As I mentioned, there was one tower in Baldhead Cliff. There was this one in in uh, a Nubble Point. And there was another tower that was down uh, just south of Godfrey's Cove. It was called Sealhead Point, but it was on a street down there now called Lock Lane. The, the Baldhead Tower uh, Bald Head Cliff Tower was demolished in 1980 to make way for a private home. I mean, uh, to make way for actually for expansion at the at the Cliff House. The Godfrey's Cove Tower was demolished in 1980 to make way for a private home. This tower that's out on Noble Point is actually still there. You can't really recognize it. Number one, there's, there's so much built up around out there that you can't hardly even see it from Double Road. But the, also the the uh, architecture of the building has changed. The, the barracks piece, which was the back end of this building, has been shrunk, about cut in half. The tower itself no longer has horizontal windows. It has kind of rectangular windows. So, but it's still there and it's a, it is a private home at this point. I know a lot about this my tower. My, my mother was taking that. I just make a comment. My mother was taking this picture because my parents in 1951 bought most of that property that's south of this tower. It's where viewpoint is now, but that's where I lived from 1951 until 1993. And we own that property. We built some cottages there. I have been through that building. I I know that point of in that property pretty well, and and uh, that's just a comment. Okay, uh, no, leave it right there because I'm going to go on to yeah, leave it there. I just want to talk about the Coast Guard Auxiliary. This was where civilians did assist. The Coast Guard not only had responsibility for the two lighthouses, but they had responsibility for coastal patrols and they established three coastal patrol areas one was called the cape netic beach patrol which included long sands and and short sands they had a garfrey's cove beach patrol and they had a york harbor patrol these they recruited volunteers to join with the coast guard auxiliary which um, was a non-military side of the Coast Guard to be able to, I guess it freed up the Coast Guard men to do what they needed to do, but um, but the walking the beaches and the patrols were done primarily by York citizens. Uh, and in the old York Historical Society, I came across a pretty good uh, article that was mentioned or quotes about a guy named Eddie Cooper and George Gilchrist. The name's not familiar to me, but they were assigned to do the, the uh, Cape Netic Beach Patrol. They would start each, these patrols, by the way, were done at night and they were done throughout the year. The, uh, <clears throat> the so these two gentlemen, I guess they had a diary or some recording where they said that they started walking it was south of south of uh, Long Sands. I, my picture was, you know, in the Cape or in the Camp Eaton type of area. But they would walk the whole length of Long Sands. And then they'd walk Short Sands 
they checked in on a time clock in the Fairmont Hotel, uh, which is next door to where the Union Bluff is now. And then they would walk back. Round trip was about six miles. And they did this summer and winter. They mentioned that it was pretty tough going through the snow in the winter on the, on these beach patrols. So pretty dedicated guys to be able to walk in the snow in the dead of the winter. And again, not, you know, there weren't German U-boats all over the place here. So they had, it had to be boring, but that's what the volunteers did. Another thing that the um, Coast Guard did on the Coast Guard auxiliary is that they needed maybe some help, additional help on coastal patrols, people that had boats. So if you were 18 years or older and you did not have you were below an a1 draft status you could and you owned a boat that was 16 feet or longer you could join the coast guard auxiliary they they the coast guard would give you a radio in most cases and when you went out onto the ocean i would imagine the fishermen and the lobstermen they were the ones that did this they you you had access to the radio and and you could watch for German subs out there or landing parties along the shores. So it was another volunteer um, way for people to volunteer their time and helping with the war cause. Next slide. See how I'm doing on time. I guess I'm doing okay. Rationing. I want to talk about rationing a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we talk about volunteer versus mandatory rationing was a mandatory exercise there was a mandatory requirement of everyone in the united states uh, there was just not enough materials of food and shoes and basic material to keep the troops overseas fed and and clothed and also the people back home so the the government instituted a, a way to conserve the supplies and so they instituted a rationing system that would limit would would actually help to limit the amount of the distribution of various materials and supplies uh, to the civilians in the united states they had booklets that were issued we had stamps in them and if you went to the grocery store to try to buy something that was listed as a rationed item, you know, some sugar, sugar was rationed. Uh, you had to have your money, but you also had to have a stamp for the, for the uh, rationing for the, for the sugar. If you used it up during the course of the month, you didn't get any more sugar because uh, you, you used up your allocation. Tires were the first thing that were rationed right after it was January 1942, no one could buy tires, uh, primarily because Japan had a lock on the Asia Pacific region, which is where a lot of the rubber came from. But there was a shortage of rubber. You couldn't buy tires, you could, buy, you could fix your tires and patch your tires, but you couldn't buy new tires. Um, there were certain exemptions that were made for like doctors and delivery trucks or police and fire and that were made for any sorts of tires. Um, but most everyone, the normal citizens, they couldn't buy tires. Um, talking about, well, tires, personal automobiles, they didn't make cars in 1942 and 43. If you wanted a new car, uh, you couldn't go buy one because all of the automotive plants across the country changed over to making military equipment, tanks and ambulances and trucks. And, and even some of the plants were changed over to make aircraft and other types of military equipment. So you couldn't buy, if someone wants to sell your 1943 Chevrolet antique, tell them, no, they didn't make Chevrolets in 1943. Um, it would be one up on them. Food, um, food was rationed starting in 42. Uh, gasoline was rationed. I was looking at the allocation. Uh, 
gasoline, you could get with your stamp, you could get three gallons of gasoline each week. That was the limit that you had for your gasoline. So people didn't start taking trips. They didn't take Sunday afternoon rides around because they they very much had to conserve the gasoline. Food, um, coffee was added to the list in November of 42. Meats, fats, canned fish, cheese, canned milk, all of March of 43, they were added. One of the things, there were a couple items that were not rationed. One was fruits and vegetables. And the other was one that helped the town of York. Fresh fish was not a rationed. You didn't need a stamp for fish or shellfish. So in York, uh, people would maybe substitute fish that they could get more readily because the people who had boats and could go out and get it. But you would maybe substitute fish for meat because meat was rationed too. So lots of items, um, one little, oh yes, that's right. Also like house appliances, they didn't make those either. So if you needed a washing machine during the war, you couldn't buy one or a vacuum cleaner. They just didn't sell them. I was looking at some of the food list and I didn't realize this, but macaroni and cheese, you didn't need many stamps, ration stamps for macaroni and cheese. And Kraft didn't even know they made Kraft macaroni and cheese in World War II, but they did. Kraft sold 50 million boxes of macaroni and cheese during the war years. So uh, I guess that was one of the favorites foods. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, these two slides in here are credited to Elaine Wood, who is on the phone or on this line. She's one of the administrators of the York uh, History Group. And these are, these were um, ration book that was ration book number one that was issued to her father. And, um, and she found these and we took a picture of them and put them in here. Families could share this. Like if the husband worked and the, the wife was one that went to the grocery store, uh, the wife could be designated as the person that is going to go buy the food for the family. So that's that. Rationing lasted throughout the war, but I was surprised that sugar actually, it's, I came across it was the only commodity that was um, held on after the war. They didn't, um, they didn't stop rationing sugar until June of 1947. I guess maybe that's, you know, I was thinking of that. Maybe that's where the expression like, you know, the one neighbor would go next door to the other neighbor and say, can I borrow a cup of sugar? Well, it's probably because it was rationed and they just, it was easier to ask your neighbor. There was a lot, there was a black market for rationing, which was kind of a black market against rationing. Uh, where people sold some of these stamps. and um, But the grocers were told, you've got to take the stamps out of the book. But there was a black market, and people were taken to court and summons for not abiding by the rules and regulations. Let's go to the next slide. We're into an area of volunteer services. <clears throat> I was looking at some of the statistics and and I came up with the four that I came up with of the four volunteer activities that were the most popular in York. One was called Victory Gardens. I'm going to talk about all four of these. One was scrap and salvage drives. One was war bonds and the other one I classified as medical and Red Cross. Um, not everyone could walk the beach in the winter, but most people could plant a garden in their backyard. And the government very much encouraged people to grow their own food, fruits and vegetables. That's what they wanted people to do. And they called them victory gardens. Instead, you know, instead of a backyard garden, that didn't have much of a pizzazz to it. 
but victory, it was because if you can plant a garden and grow your own food and conserve the commercially grown food for the troops overseas, then it will contribute to the victory of the United States. And so that's why they named it the Victory Garden. They had a major messaging campaign on Victory Gardens, and it worked. Um, these types of, this is a poster that was an advertising that was, that was in, um, you know, they had them in magazines and libraries and community centers everywhere, you, you know, plant your Victory Garden. There were, How many? There were about 15 million victory gardens that were established across the United States in 1942. By 1944, there were 20 million people growing their own food. By 1944, there were 40 percent of all the fresh fruits, vegetables consumed in the United States were grown in these victory gardens, these home gardens, and they could be community gardens too. Not everyone had place on their property to maybe have a garden, but they could be a community garden. But it was a big success. And it and again, it freed up the foods for the food, the necessary food for the for the soldiers and sailors that were overseas fighting in the war. Oh, let's see, let's go to the next slide. I've got some some newspaper articles, as they say, would clip. This is one that talks about York, um, some names of people in York that helped out with some victory garden. You'll read that when you're when you read my whole paper. Next slide. That's my mother. My mother and father had a victory garden on they planted strawberries. And um and they had a lot of strawberries and they shared them and, but that was the, the, what they did. By the way, my mother, I just will make a comment. My mother did a lot more in World War II. She was a, she was a, one of the wardens, the air, the air raid wardens in the neighborhood. She was an RN, so she uh, helped to volunteer and she volunteered at the, Port, my, at the Portsmouth Hospital. My parents lived in Kittery, and she ran the Victory Garden. So here she she helped out with all sorts of blood drives and school health facilities. But um, but here she is digging the trenches for the strawberries. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, let me see here. We're going to talk about scrap and salvage drives. There was a shortage of raw material and there was, and it was necessary to have neighborhood drives, town-wide drives to be able to collect material that could be used for, for the war effort. Uh, one was rubber and uh, they needed it. President Roosevelt in the last two weeks of June initiated a, a scrap rubber drive for the last two weeks of June nationwide. And um, these pictures here are not taken in New York, but they, um, but they had a rubber drive and people contributed 450 tons of rubber across the nation. Excess tires, and it wasn't just tires that they were collecting, but raincoats and hot water bottles and boots and floor mats from cars. But they collected a lot of rubber. Uh, some of it was poor quality and they couldn't, unfortunately, couldn't use it. There was a, an aluminum drive that was held early on where they had a shortage of aluminum and they put a plea out to the Housewives of America to go through your kitchen and get any aluminum pots and pans and, and uh, collect them. And they would be collected locally. York participated. And uh, you could um, send it and then they could use it in more central locations where it was melted down or whatever they did with scrap aluminum. 70,000 tons of aluminum were, were collected across the country. 
There was one, another plea that was put out to the women of America in the kitchen. I guess they figured all the women were in the kitchen, and they probably were back then. Um, to take any excess kitchen oils, grease, fats, and take them to the butcher, take them to your grocery store, where they could be consolidated and eventually um, used and processed down. Apparently, kitchen oils and grease had glycerin in them, and they needed glycerin for artillery shells. And they and the Allies certainly needed a lot of artillery shells. And so this was another successful way to get people to volunteer that if you had excess cooking oils and grease, that it would help in the making of artillery shells. Scrap iron, tin, copper. This was, um, they had a number of drives, drives here in York too. Boy Scouts were very much involved. Go to the next slide. It shows Boy Scouts, I think. This is the Boy Scouts helping. This is not a York picture, but it it's very similar to what happened. I mean, the, where they had tin and copper and any other metals, and the Boy Scouts were very active uh, nationwide, but they were here in York. They were very much active in, in these um, scrap metal drives. And then again, the government could use that excess. They could recycle all of this material and build airplanes and ships and whatever military equipment was, uh, was needed. Next slide. Paper. 1942 paper became uh, scarce. And they actually had a big paper drive in 1942, but the mills were inundated with, with too much paper and they shut down the, the paper drives. But in 1944, they had another acute shortage of paper and uh, they were, they put out pleas to get more paper. Here in York, uh, this is, well, it talks here about, this was from June of 44. If you notice there, it says that they had a quota of 14, 16,415 pounds. Towns had quotas. Go to the next slide and please. This is the populations of the towns that were in the area. If you notice down at the bottom, it says York had a population of 3,283 people. The quota was, is that for each person in town, you needed to collect five pounds of paper. And that's where the 16,000 pounds of paper each month on these paper drives had to be collected. So there was a lot of busy people collecting paper uh, for the paper drives in, uh, in York. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts even got involved in some of this too. And, uh, the York Fire Department, I was reading about one of these articles. I don't see it here, but it talks about, well, oh, this one actually, no, go to the next one. Kind of in fine print there, but it mentions over on the right there, it says the fire department assisted in the collection. I, by this point in time, again, the fire department, weren't they weren't doing air raid drills but they were helping in other capacities. And here's the case where they were helping with paper drives. And again, this paper was used by the military mostly or, and to be able to be, it was needed for packaging and needed for military purposes. Next drive, uh, next slide. One of the, as with victory gardens, there were a lot of posters, a lot of messaging on this, save your waste paper. And uh, this is just an example of many different messages that were put out, a typical poster that was put out for the recycling and saving of paper. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about war bonds. War bonds, we call them for years savings bonds, but during the war, at the very beginning of World War II, they were called defense bonds. The government 
the U.S. government needed money to fund World War II. They could have put big, heavy taxes on people's uh, pay, and they did institute some additional taxes and and withholding, withholding started back then. Uh, but the government came up with the idea of issuing, having people make an investment in the war. It was a way to get people to participate. It was a patriotic thing to do. And there was plenty of money around. Uh, most of the, you know, the people were employed. There were plenty of jobs and people were employed. And, uh, but they didn't really have any place to spend their money. I mean, food was rationed and you couldn't take trips in your car. So what they did is they, they had people buy war bonds. And war bonds are just an investment for you. If you invested $18 and 75 cents, you'd get a $25 bond that matured in 10 years. So if you bought one in 1943 in 1953, your $18 and 75 cents would turn into $25. And they had different denominations of these. A hundred dollar bond would cost you $75. But it was a way in which the government raised money for um, to fund World War II. Between 1941 and 1945, the government raised $185 billion in uh, from people on war bonds. There were 84 million Americans that participated in um, in buying war bonds. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next slide. This is this is a defense stamp book. These were these were issued, and everyone's in this together. So the people that were worked in jobs had money taken out of their pay. My dad worked at the Navy Yard, and every time he got paid, he'd put a little aside. They put There was a payroll deduction program. He'd put a little bit of money aside for the war bond, and when he had the money uh, enough accumulated, he'd get a, I don't know, a 25 or 50 or $100 war bond that was be issued to him. But school children, they wanted school children to buy. Well, they couldn't buy it, but parents could buy stamps. And they had these booklets that were issued. This is a booklet that was issued. My, my parents got this, and it was issued to my brother. Let's go to the next slide. There's the stamps, but, and then go to the next slide. So, my parents put aside 25 cents a week for my brother's defense booklet here, the defense stamp booklet. And when he got to $18.75, he would have got a, a war bond. Uh, he was born in 1944, and in 1945, the war ended. It was 16 weeks into the, or thereabouts, I don't know how many weeks. It was into the war, so he never got his book filled out all the way. But I've got the book. If he wants to cash it in for the $16, I looked it up. You can do that. It's still an obligation of the United States. But I think we'll just keep it as kind of a souvenir of World War II. Let's go to the next slide. We're on to a section now called medical and and uh, Red Cross. A lot of participation in York in World War II in this particular category for the women in York. And one of the areas that they needed help with is on the medical side. Um, and York was, they teamed up with the Red Cross. The Red Cross was had an organization for York County up in Saco. And, um, but they were in affiliation with some of the hospitals to have training classes for, for um, nurses aides. And this is a picture of the first graduating class from April of 1943 of nurses aides. They got their diplomas and 
we do have in the in the paper the names of all of these people but i guess they it mentions here that they were um you had to do 80 hours of study and practice and then you had to commit to 150 hours of service a year for the duration of your time these were volunteers um there was a real need for medical help and some of the doctors and nurses were shipped overseas to help with the troops but you needed to have medical care back home here too and there were classes like this were held for the nurses aides to be able to help in the hospitals and to help with the medical care of the people of town again it was a volunteer service very successful so this is uh this is a good picture. I get this one from the uh, Old York Historical Society also. Next slide. I was trying to find an article that matched those pictures. And this is an article that was in the Portsmouth Herald about this particular graduating class. Some of the names. This is where I found some of the names. But since then, we found another picture that actually had the names in order, which are really great. But this just is a something to read about the first class of nurses aides that graduated it mentions here for the york county chapter of the american red cross of soco of which york red cross is a branch lots of participation they also had in the red cross they also had a, a service called the red cross motor corps women were the primary people they they drove trucks and they, they it was for transportation needs initially it was set up for the transportation of the injured and the, the wounded but in a town like this i mean it was set up to help out with any sorts of transportation typically medical in nature but um but the women were the ones who who um uh, were responsible for the transportation again a volunteer type of service and uh, i was re even reading that there was some volunteer work here or some work were on paper on the paper drives that were collected that the red cross motor corps helped out with some of the york paper drives and i guess they needed to have vehicles that carried all that paper let's um let's go to the next slide this is an interesting one I got this from the Old York Historical Society. This is Jeffers Tavern. Some of you are familiar with Jeffers Tavern. It's now located down on Lindsay Road, across from the First Parish Church. It's part of the Old York Museum buildings, colonial type buildings. Miss Elizabeth Perkins um, is very much related to this particular building. By the way, there was a great article in the on the website uh, that was posted by the York History Group about Miss Elizabeth Perkins and her participation here in the town of York and her volunteer services in historic buildings and garden clubs. And she was very active. Um, she was active in this particular building in that they, this building was built and was erected in wells it mentions, you can see here, it says 1760. I've seen three different dates, but this says 1760, Jeffers Tavern. This building was taken apart piece by piece and was moved to York in 1941. And it was much under the direction and financial support of Elizabeth Perkins. It was located on York Street. I remember as a kid growing up that this building was out by the corner of Radon Road and York Street. And that's where it is in this particular picture. I think it was in the 1960s or so it was moved down to, or whenever, I don't know when it was, 1960s, it was moved down to Lindsay Road. But this building was used during World War II. Um, there were classroom training. The Red Cross was active in, in uh, uh, instructional courses. They had courses in home nutrition and home nursing. They even had like rolling bandages and first aid. Um, but there were two rooms in this building that were reserved for the classroom training. The Red Cross also had volunteers. People helped out with blood drives. 
I'm not sure if there were blood drives held in this building or not, but certainly the Red Cross was very much involved in that. <clears throat> the Red Cross also was the conduit to get clothing to um, the troops that needed it overseas and also to the other allied countries that needed clothing. And uh, this is, I don't know if this clothing was being packed or stored in the building or was being moved out of the building because all of the clothing that was collected in York uh, was moved up to Saco and then eventually it was shipped overseas. Uh, but this building was very, very important for um, the storage of and the assistance during World War II. They also stored temporarily some of the paper, like for paper drives in here. Paper was taken to Portsmouth and was put on ships over in Portsmouth to be shipped out to paper mills. By the way, the scrap metal was also shipped over eventually to Portsmouth, put on freight cars and trains and shipped out. Let's go to the next slide. The clothing that was shipped overseas to the Allied nations and and the and to the, and sometimes to troops that needed it, a lot of times needed to be repaired and needed to be mended. It might be as simple as a button, or it might be a torn or a zipper, or socks needed to be darned. But the elderly got very involved in that, and throughout World War II. There were church groups and home groups that got together and repaired clothing. And um, this is this is a group. I didn't have a picture of uh, someone in York, but York and Kittery did about the same thing in that they repaired clothing and shipped it up to Saco. This is a picture taken in my grandmother's house. My grandmother is on the left. She's the one taking a tally. These ladies worked all through the war repairing clothing and uh, very, very dedicated toward that. And, uh, and then they would, they would ship it out. Good group. I just want to comment on this, on this particular group, because there's something else I know that they didn't stop after World War II. Um, they did as far as shipping it to the Red Cross, but this group of ladies, was uh, continued in 1948 afterwards. They got together and they formed a group called the Fix It Ladies. They, I guess they had a good time during World War II fixing clothing and, and it took the boredom away from whatever they were bored with. And they formed a group called the Fix It Ladies. And it usually had about 15 ladies in it. And from 1948 until 1965, these women and if they died, they would replace them with another elderly person. And from 48 to 65, they continued mending old clothes and shipping them all over the world. It's just amazing. I wrote a paper on that. If anyone wants to see it at the end of this report, um, just send me an email. I'll send you the I, I, it was a paper I wrote for the Kittery Historical Museum on the Fix-It Ladies of Kittery. Let's go to the last slide here. Um, one more. We talk about the elderly helping. Well, what about the, you know, what about the, the Girl Scouts? And here's, a, here's an article that I picked up out of the newspaper, Buttons Are Wanted. Buttons. So the York Girl Scouts now going door to door and they're collecting buttons for uh, the Red Cross and for the large quota of sewing that's expected to arrive. Uh, so all ranges of people volunteered here in World War II. The elderly here, the girls, the, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, you name it, you know, the people that were not eligible for the draft, people spending time on observation towers looking for German aircraft, or walking along the shores. Just an amazing turnout and um, very patriotic time. To uh, it, it was a unique time in York. Um, you know, we've seen, we've seen after 
World War, well, after the trade towers came down, we saw a kind of a quick flash of patriotism in the United States, but nothing like there was during World War II, where everyone chipped in. There was no bitching and complaining either. It was, I always think back of Kennedy saying, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And World War II was a good example of that. People weren't saying, oh, how can the government help me out here? They were saying, how can I help? How can I help in the war effort? How can we help the troops overseas? So saving and conserving and volunteering became a, a way of life. And, and, and it's, you know, these folks need the appreciation just as much as everybody else that contributed to the war effort. That is my spiel. I did pretty good. I was had about 45 minutes. Uh, Kevin is going to open it up to a question and answer. I don't know if you get question and answers coming in, but the other people from the York History Group, uh, Kevin McKinney and Elaine Wood are going to come on to the line here too, I guess. Yeah, so we're going to stop screen sharing right now and we'll bring everybody on.